Hi, everyone. My name is Giovanni, once again. How many students do we have um, in, in here? Do you guys know? About 20. 20. Uh, are they all attending uh, UCLA? No, they're actually in the process of transferring. So they're starting their transfer journey. So flying. Okay. In nice. Well, welcome to this wonderful workshop or whatever you guys call it. I'm just doing this real quick because we are serving transitioning students from high school that are coming to uh, ELAC. And every summer, wow, we get bombarded with, we have like 20, 40 high schools around in our community that they heard that ELAC is number one college in California. And I just wanted to uh, give you a little bit of that information. Uh, in California, we have 114 colleges and uh, we're number one for uh, Latino students, minority students, the students with disabilities. As you can see, I'm in a wheelchair. Uh, I've been in a wheelchair for 28 years and now I love uh, telling my students, you know, I'm in a wheelchair. Just know that I know your struggles. I know your obstacles. I know that we cannot even find that love in our own families sometimes. Why? Because we cannot judge our families. They didn't have the opportunity that we have as individuals uh, with, I call it condition because that's how I feel comfortable now. I, don't, I only call it disability when I have to deal with a state, county, federal government, then I call it disability because they know what is a disability. I always use the examples with my students. Let's go walk around, roll around, and you'll see uh, how many individuals are gonna be just pointing fingers and say, oh yes, you are disabled, but you're not, right? Well, just letting you know that I feel comfortable when I share that because I over um, became those barriers. I over um, study um, how to become self-confidence, how to improve my self-esteem because uh, now it's not about me. It's about my students. We're serving about 2,000 students with different conditions at ELAC. And I just love it that 1,000 students, they're, they're mine. They're like my kids. And I might not be look, looking old, but trust me, I can have an 18-year-old, 20-year-old um, student, and I can be their father. So I am lucky in the sense that I don't look uh, that old without offending no one, but I'm just letting you know that even that is all about awareness, all about how we feel. And this is not uh, what I'm talking about, that it's not gonna be a good only for our students presently here, but it's good for everybody. It's good for me because this is a therapy for me every day when I talk to my students about their struggles, about their different um, conditions that they're facing. So uh, thank you for, for this opportunity. I wish that I could have give you uh, an hour or two hours, but once again, because um, I am working in uh, two different departments at ELAC, I got hired as a general counselor back in 2016. I waited 15 years for my job, 15 years. I just made my tenure track last month. I got sworn in as a tenure track, um, working for different community colleges, providing same services for students with disabilities. Uh, I wanna talk to you a little bit about the services that we provide at ELAC. Uh, as a team, we uh, try to take all those barriers and obstacles away from the students. And the line that I use every day with my students is that my success depends on your success. If you're not successful as a student, I'm not giving you something that I'm missing. And you probably have to talk to a different counselor uh, in order for you to succeed in college. Um, I have many students in UCLA that I transferred from ELAC. I have students all over California right now. 
um, UCs, private universities, um, Cal States. I'm also in charge of uh, the Department of Rehabilitation Program at ELAC, and that is something that I proudly share with you because no other college has the number of students that we enrolled in DOR. We have about 500 students uh, with the permanent rehab that uh, we prepare uh, them to transfer and to pursue a bachelor's or master's degree and uh, the permanent rehab pay for that tuition. Even if uh, students are undocumented, I mean, that's something that, that we're uh, missing there because uh, Latinos, African-Americans, Asian students, we look so different individuals. We look so different, but we're so alike because uh, family members think that, oh, my son, my daughter have a disability and cannot go to college because he or she doesn't have a social security number. After I meet with family members and, and students, wow, it's just a blessing and opportunity to give back to my community. Now that I'm a counselor, I'm a an assistant professor. I work as, a, as an instructor. When I was part-timer, I worked part-time as an adjunct counselor for 10 years for different community colleges. And uh, uh, you can find all my projects in Google because they put that for, for everybody. Now I've been getting um, phone calls from so many of these colleges. I apply in 30 colleges um, to get this job. Uh, ELAC was my 23rd. Uh, I got rejected by 22 colleges. Uh, seven of them, they don't even call me for an interview. And I just feel so happy to share that because uh, I tell my students, you know, if it's not your time, it's not gonna be your time. Even if you push hard enough, it's not gonna be your time. Just be patient, be confident that good things will be coming if you just focus on your purpose. And that's Giovanni at Iraq. So I will, I'm here just to tell you that um, it doesn't matter where you go to school. Um, it doesn't matter. For some people, depending on your culture without offending no one, they think that, yes, if you go to uh, one of the Ivy League school, you're gonna get a job real quick. That's what I thought when I, got my master's degree, but then after I got my master's degree, I'm like, is it because I'm in a wheelchair? Is it because I'm bald? Is it because I have tattoos all over? Uh, I just didn't know and I was like just doubting about myself. But thanks to all that, I think I never give up and, and I'm here just sharing this information that it's not about me, it's not bragging about all this, but I just wanted to encourage you that there are so many wonderful people like the ones here presently here, just encouraging you to pursue a higher education. If you if you ever need anything from ELAC, please just ask about Giovanni. And I will be more than happy to assist you with anything that you might need. Any questions? Because I only have 30 minutes, um, I have a student right now at one o'clock, a new student coming from high school that I need to fill out, fill out um, his intake application to join DSPS. And DSPS, uh, we uh, changed the name. It used to be Disabled Student Services. We agree in administration that that name had a lot of stigma. Uh, many students didn't wanna go to a Disabled Student Center because just looking at us being in a wheelchair or being blind or being, uh, uh, let's say if your face is this figure, that it's just a difference that we got to become more aware about the conditions and just respect an individual up there uh, and not look at how they looked. Respect them as a human being. Uh, and we changed the name to Diverse Abilities, Support, Programs, and Services. Same, same acronym, DSPS. It used to be called Disabled Student Program and Services. Now it's called Diverse Abilities, 
support program and services. If you look for the first letter in the dictionary, you're not gonna find it because administration came out with that word, diverse abilities. We are very, very diverse with many abilities in only one place. And that's why we agree, yes, why not? So let's call it diverse abilities. So now it's called diverse abilities, support program services, DSPS. And I'm trying to bring just awareness for my college. ELAC opened their heart. I'm very faithful, like when it comes to someone giving me love. And I feel that I found the love that I was looking for as a professional at ELAC. Um, and once again, I'm just here to, to give you this information to, to, to make you aware about all the conditions that are up there. All you need to do is respect. If you see someone in a wheelchair, sometimes, hey, you're gonna be opening the door for that individual, don't do that. Don't do that because you'll be telling me myself, you cannot even open that door. So you're gonna be putting me down without telling me, I know that you've been trying, you will be trying to be helpful, but this is just an example that I'm giving you how you have to treat individuals with different conditions. I tell the whole world where I give uh, motivational speeches that the disability world is like a different language, that you have to learn the language in order to help someone. And if you don't know the language, just always ask, can I help you? I always share this with every lady because at ELAG we have 85% lady, 85 of ladies that will work, professionals, teachers, faculties, classifieds, and 25% men. And I always joke around. Imagine you marry to an individual with a, in a wheelchair. Will you do that? they start reflecting and thinking and they don't even know what to answer. Why? Because awareness, awareness. We're human beings. And I've been in a wheelchair 28 years. My son is in a wheelchair. He's seven years old. He's gonna be eight years old next month. He got diagnosed with several palsy. And I just tell all my students, I am educating you because one day my son will be looking for these services. I don't know. I would love to think that you're gonna be the professional helping my son to take all those barriers and obstacles and have the awareness that we all should have before working in this profession. Any questions? And please don't be afraid to ask questions because the only question, the only dumb question is the one that you never ask. Because tomorrow you might think, I should have asked him that question. Please ask questions. I'm an open book. Just ask questions. The more you ask, the more educated it will become. Thank you, Giovanni. Um, thank you so much for sharing all of your information and also your advocacy. Um, I'm going to just have Brian, if you could briefly ask your question, but we do need to move to um, Carmen and Kaya in a second. But Brian, if you wanted to go ahead. Hey, what's up, Jill? Ryan, that's one of my success stories right there. Graduated from UCLA. So uh, proud of you. Still up there. Um, so if students decide to join, you mentioned the DOR Department of Rehab, right? Yes. Moving forward, I know for myself, the Department of Rehab helped me um, through my higher education. How can students apply for the DOR program and what services can they utilize that will also help them be successful throughout their undergrad? Just make sure to apply for uh, DSPS services at UCLA. If you attend UCLA or any school where you're gonna be attending because every school that it receives uh, a stay in federal money, they should have DSPS services. Uh, private institutions, uh, they do not provide DSPS services. But yes, to answer your questions, uh, if they decide to go to any of uh, uh, community colleges uh, in our community, uh, 
you guys can come see me at ELAC at my office. Uh, and then we can, I can provide all that information for you guys to apply. But remember that if I'm gonna be referring you, I need to see at least two to three semesters, only A's and B's, no C's and D's, because that is the technique that we use to prepare our students to pursue a bachelor's degree. A's and B's, no C's and D's. If you're coming from high school, high school is, 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 is a different ballgame. I mean, in high school, we have legal guardians, we have parents that they do everything for us. The one thing that I will highly recommend you is to become independent. If mommy and daddy was uh, supporting you 100% even to fill out a form, please start becoming independent because in college, no one is gonna be telling you go to class. No one is gonna be telling you do your assignments. You have to do it yourself. Don't procrastinate and just uh, start working hard. As you know, if we have a condition or any disability, we work three times harder than someone who doesn't have a condition. And I'm not, I don't wanna be judging nobody, but these are just the statistics up there that, that yes, I mean, if you don't have a condition, if you're able body, yes, you can work in construction, you can work in Jack and the Box, you can work in McDonald's. Imagine us in disability, with physical disability, can we work doing that? And that was the exact same thing that I used to think when I was in, in high school. When I was in high school, my life was, you don't even want to know how sad it was. But hey, um, once again, becoming independent and just thinking about you. And not, don't think about mommy, don't think about your brother, sister, because you gotta make it happen yourself. You have all the opportunities, you have all the resources, make sure to not be afraid to ask for those resources and those the help that is there for you. So yes, Ryan, uh, going back to you, hopefully I answered your question. Uh, if you are the students with A's and B's, look for Giovanni. And you can get my uh, email uh, through Google, East LA College, just put it, East LA College, Giovanni Munoz, and that's it. And uh, just make sure to have those A's and B's. You'll be one of my students that I'm gonna be referring to apply for DOR. Make sure to apply for all the resources that are in uh, university where you're gonna be attending. EOPS, uh, California First Promise. Uh, right now I'm supporting four, uh, four populations besides the regular students. And these populations are uh, undocumented students, uh, formerly incarcerated students, um, the other two is DSPS and LG LGBT plus. LGBT plus is a huge one for us. If we're Latinos, if we're African-Americans, if we're Asian, because those cultures, they used to not accept somebody who was gay, someone who was lesbian. And I tell the whole world, you know what, if you have some type of blood, Latino, African-American, Asian, and program what it, what it was programmed when you were a little kid, because every value in your unconscious mind is wrong. Our parents tell us when we're little kids, oh, don't talk to the stranger, because it's a stranger. Right there, you start programming your kid to be quiet, to not ask questions. Why is that? That's why we don't have social skills. Look at a Latino, African-American, Asian, so quiet. We never speak. Why? Because we got programmed those values to not ask questions, share information. I unprogram all those values from my unconscious mind. Your unconscious mind is 75%. Your conscious mind is 25%. Your conscious mind is when you are awake and you share, ask questions. Unconscious, 75. So, please. Bye, Giovanni, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry to cut you off. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for all the 
information that you're sharing. It is a wealth of information, a wealth of knowledge. I wish that we could have a bit more time, but we do need to get to our two other research yes. um, presenters. Yes, I totally understand. Totally yeah, understand. It is totally fine, but thank you so much. Um, And then like Giovanni said, look for Giovanni. He will put his information in the chat, but we are going to move on next to um Dr. Carmen Stevens. Um, very nice to see you. She is from PCC's DSPS program and you can go ahead and take it away. Hello, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you, Giovanni, for going first, I believe. Um, you really did a really awesome job. You covered like all the bases. <laughs> um, but I'm Dr. Carmen Stevens, and like they were saying, I work at Pasadena City College with students um, who have disabilities, and we assist our students in prescribing accommodations so then they could be successful in their classes. And so I am one of the only counselors assigned to our program. So I help with all of the educational plans, all of the major selection, um, class advisement. Um, students are still able to see counselors in general counseling, our career center, EOPS, um, or other programs where counselors are housed, um, in addition to seeing myself. Um, at our campus, we have teacher specialists that focus specifically on accommodations. So they will prescribe accommodations on a case-by-case -case basis based off of the documentation that's submitted. So um, a student can bring in uh, prior high school records. So a lot of times that will be their IEP and their psychoeducational report, uh, medical documentation from their therapist, their primary care doctor, their physical therapist, their speech therapist, and things of that nature. Um, and then we can work with them on prescribing the appropriate accommodations. I always like to tell students that accommodations aren't an advantage. I know sometimes people have that misconception that, oh, this student is having it easier or they're getting ahead. That is absolutely not the case. The student is just getting and even playing field. So as what was shared earlier, you know, sometimes it takes a little longer to do work. So then that student might need an accommodation to allow them enough time to complete their work. Um, some of our accommodations include um, accommodation for testing, um, reading materials, uh, calculators, priority registration, um, working with our assistive technology specialists and getting um, training on different apps and devices that can help students in their classes and when they're doing their homework. But again, I really wanna stress that everything is um, designed and provided on a case-by-case -case situation once the professional meets with the student and reviews the student needs. We also work very closely with Department of Rehabilitation to help our students in one, getting additional funding and support for college, but also two, in helping to establish internships, career opportunities, and getting job placement. So a lot of our students that take classes currently at PCC and in the past was also participating in Department of Rehabilitation. Um, some students also want to do it after they complete all their classes, and that's perfectly okay as well. A student can definitely get employment assistance through the Career Center on our campus, through our advisement, and then through Department of Rehabilitation. We often host workshops with the Career Center where employers are specifically targeting and looking to hire individuals with disabilities. So we do try to collaborate as much as possible with other programs and departments on campus to make sure our students get a full rounded um, experience. Do we take questions now or do you want to have the other person speak? We're going to be taking the questions towards the end. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Very welcome.
Okay, so up next, we also have Kia Leeson. Um, she works for UCLA uh, as a disability specialist for the Center for Accessible Education. And oh, hello, hi, Kia. <laughs> Hi, it's uh, my name is Kaya. Hi, um, so like I said, Sorry. I'm a disability specialist at the CAE. Prior to coming to UCLA, um, I worked at a community college, so in one of the DSPNS offices. Um, I'll read our mission statement, but I think the kind of the accommodations have been covered. Um, so the mission of the Center for Accessible Education is to create an accessible, inclusive, and supporting learning environment. And we do this by facilitating academic accommodations and disability advocacy for the campus community through a collaborative effort with faculty, staff, and students. Um, usually we have a fantastic um, group of students who have their own advocacy and support groups as well. Um, and I think we can move on to questions, maybe, so if we have time. Yes, I'll ask the first question. So um, for any of our panelists, if you are able to elaborate on how many students on your campuses typically use your services, and um, I think we could probably start with, um, with Carmen. Yes, um, typically at any given time, we have around 2,500 students enrolled in our program. Um, and depending on the semesters, it will depend on all the students that are currently active. And so what that means is, for example, we just concluded our summer session. And so some students do not take summer classes. So even though we have um, around 2,500 students, all of them are not taking classes for the summer. Some of them will just be taking classes for the fall term. Thank you. Dr. Stevens, and then the same question for um, Kaya, or Kia, sorry. Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? How many students do I have? Do we have? Yes, so how many students um, typically use your services at UCLA? Um, we currently have, uh, the last numbers I have are about 3,500 that are um, approved for services. I would say might even be up from that um, at this time. Thank you. I'll hand it off to Rydia. Okay, thank you. Um, and then our next question is, how or what has been the experience of students with your programs during COVID-19? Wow, that's a Whoever big question. Answer, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, that's a big question. Um, you know, I would say the experience has been different depending on who you ask. Some of our students really love the online environment, um, but for the students who love or do not like the online environment, I would say it's been stressful for a little bit of everybody. Um, a lot of our students are um, fearful to be on campus or to be um, in a classroom environment around others. And then a lot of students are fearful of COVID, right? And of possibly getting it or spreading it to their family and friends. Um, so I would say that's a lot of the concern right now. Um, and then some of our students are choosing not to take classes until everything's just a little bit more cleared up and um, they feel safer. Oh, and I did just wanna add before anybody else goes, um, some of our students are thriving. So some students who struggled in some subjects are um, finding that they're really thriving in the online environment and their grades are much improved. So I, like I said, I think it's a little bit different per student. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. We definitely had a lot of students who um, really could even attend classes um, remotely, allowed them to attend more classes um, where they haven't been able to attend classes with us yet because um, being on campus um, for medical reasons, they weren't able to attend. Um, we also see a lot of students who um, in, enjoyed having there's more universal designs have been um, provided by um, faculty, such as like all of those classes are being recorded, captions are provided. Um, some of our professors have even allowed like additional time um, for all students or remove the time um, requirement for exams. So that has been helpful for 
all students across the board. Um, but then of course we definitely have students who have struggled um, with the concentration, kind of the engagement, not having that community engagement as well online. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. All right. And then our next question, um, what assistive technology services do your programs offer? And do you have any assistive technology experts on staff? Um, yes, we have a assistive technology specialist within our campus um, that works directly in our office and they train students on the different technology that we use. And so um, our technology can be updated, right? Um, as they offer better products or uh, newly updated products, then we do have to transition every now and then. So some of the things that we're using right now is like Criswell 3000 um, to help our students with like reading and things like that. Um, we do use other reading apps. So like Dragon Naturally Speaking, um, and there is other things to help like enlarge documents for students. Um, so it just kind of depends on what the student needs. We really try to find that resource um, to help them. Um, if we can, we try to find it uh, for free. So, and sometimes where a student doesn't have to um, be somebody with a disability to get access to it. Um, and then if it's not something in that way, then we try to prescribe, subscribe to it so then we can um, share with students. Um, so we currently do not have an assistive technology specialist on staff. We do have an alternate format specialist um, who can assist and we um, partner with other departments on campus um, with some other um, campus partners that maybe utilize the service, the, like the text-to-speech software, the dictation software um, in their own use to help train students on that. Um, all our computers and our libraries have Kurzweil on it um, in addition. Um, additional like assistive technology or assistive software on those programs. And um, we are very fortunate that we do have some funding. So if there is, um, as Dr. Steven mentioned, there's always changing technology. If there's something that works best for the student, um, we have some funding that we can kind of get unique with, um, meet the needs of unique students. Okay, thank you. Um, and then our next question is going to be, what kind of accommodations do you offer and what are the procedures and timelines to receive them? Wow, another good question. Um, again, um, accommodations are case by case. I cannot stress that enough. So even as a student or a parent of a student, um, if something's not offered to one child or one person, it could be because their disability did not warrant it. Um, so again, we're really gonna look at the documentation provided and then the interactive process you go through with your counselor, teacher specialist, um, or disability specialist, depending on what campus you're at. Um, so it's really important to speak up and share what are um, you know, your needs and what your disability is and how it affects you. Now, to me, the DSPS office or disability programs on campuses and universities are not going to be the answer and the solution, right, to all the problems or to passing every single class. Um, there are students with and without a disability who fail classes. And so it is a possibility. Our accommodations um, really should help even the playing field, right? So then the student has full access to the class material and is fully able to participate and learn as all other students are able to do. So the way our process works is a student applies um, online to our program. Once they finish applying, then we have our front desk staff that will contact them to schedule an appointment and to make sure that they have their documentation submitted. They submit that also online. Uh, once everything is submitted and up, they will do an intake appointment. And again, depending on what the student disability is and the student needs, it's usually an hour long conversation. It can be a little bit longer um, if need be. And then at that time, accommodations are prescribed. So some of our accommodations include extended time on tests. Um, and it, it does include um, alternate format for like books or documents. That could mean enlargement. That can mean um, 
getting access to it in an audio format so then the student can listen to it. Um, some of our accommodations also could include using um, like calculators on exams. Um, some of our accommodations um, include furniture. So sometimes people need a higher desk or a desk that moves up and down, um, just as an example, um, and things of that nature. So we do have a wide variety of accommodations, um, again, that are meant to address helping the student to have even access to their class. All right, so we do have um, another question. Um, actually, one of our students asked it. So thank you so much, Shelby, for your question. Um, so the question is, what assessment evaluation services do you offer for students who may have an undiagnosed disability or condition that um, they are trying to receive accommodations for? So currently at our campus, our DSPS office does not diagnose. A student will bring in documentation of their diagnosis. Thank you. And then same question, um, Akia. I'm saying we don't provide diagnosis. We might be able to um, refer students to um, different resources on campus in our health center that might be able to help the student out. We also take into consideration, um, is it something that the student's already currently um, seeking, um, re working with the healthcare provider, but working on that diagnosis. So it's very individualized. Ryan? Uh, yes. Um, so my question is, does the CAE work closely with uh, the different DSPS offices for students that are transferring to get a better understanding of what the students need as they transition from campus to campus? That's a great question. You know, we have not worked closely um, in the past, but um, I think that's a good good feedback. That's something that we could um, implement, reach out to. I'll pass Dr. Stevens my number so we can have that conversation. Yeah, or you guys let me know. The students um, can reach out, it's, it's helpful. Well, as a student that has been through the entire process, I could definitely say it would be amazing if we can get the CAE to work a little more one-on-one -on -one with the DSPS counselors and, and staff to get a better understanding of what the students need as they transition. That's all thank you. Good idea, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you for your question. Um, we also had another one in the chat. I can go ahead and ask that one. Um, so it says, do any of the accommodations include permission to record lectures? So yes, that can be an accommodation. Um, again, it's based off of the student's disability, and that could be an approved um, accommodation. I think the same thing um, for Akia. Um, do any of the accommodations also include permission to record lectures over at UCLA? Uh, yes, so it would be fall under like note taking support um, and some audio recording um, permissions may be granted based on the student's limitations. Um, and we even have some different tools that can um, students can work with for that. All righty. Well, thank you both so much. And I know that he unfortunately had to leave early, but we'd also like to thank Giovanni. Um, thank you, Carmen, Dr. Stevens, um, for your presentation about DSPS over at Pasadena City College. Thank you, Kia, for your um, presentation about um, CAE at um, UCLA. And again, Giovanni, um, for his presentations about diverse ability student support services um, over at ELAC. Um, if there's no other questions, um, we will be wrapping this up and moving on. But again, we just want to thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing all these wonderful 
um, resources, opportunities, and information both at the community college level and four-year level with our students so that they know um, better about what it will look like once they're at their CC, if they might not have known about some things that might be at their school, and then also once they do transfer over. And y'all are getting a lot of love in the chat as well. <laughs> um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I will hand this back over to Jewel. Thank you so much for having us and for hosting this great event. I just wanna encourage you guys, if you feel like you might need services and you have documentation, just reach out to us, right? It's a service that you have the right to use. So if you decide you don't wanna use it, you can stop it anytime. So just think about it and good luck everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to, to our panelists and our resource, our resources. Um, I will say, you know, we, we, part of what we're doing here is also creating space, a much needed space, as was evident in the questions that were being asked and services. So I do want to, I do want to highlight that and make mention of that, um, that there's a lot of work that we need to do to better support students um, with disabilities. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is, this is what we're doing in this space. So again, your presence and your questions and your, your participation is helping to build that space in that community. And as we transition into our student panel, also kind of our last activity for the day, last but certainly not least in any way, shape or form. Um, I've been looking forward to this so much today. Um, we are gonna be transitioning into our panel discussion. Um, so I, we have a few of our panelists here. Um, Ryan Estengo, who's been with us um, all day. So thank you, Ryan, for being here, um, as well as Brooke Abbott. And then our third panelist should be joining us any minute now. Um, Mitzi, she, um, again, is having a little bit of technical difficulty and actually just emailed me for the link again. So she'll be joining us and as soon as she does join us, um, we'll go ahead and have her introduce herself. But um, these individuals need no introduction from me. They are incredibly, incredibly capable and wonderful human beings. So I will ask them to introduce themselves and to share a little bit about themselves. And we'll go ahead and start with Brooke and then jump over to Ryan. Um, but Brooke, um, if you can just, you know, again, I've said your name and everything, but Brooke, if you can share with us your name, um, your pronouns, if you are comfortable with that, um, your position sort of you're in school. Oh, there's Mitzi. Awesome. Um, your position in school, kind of where you're, where you're at in that journey, and then maybe your, your majors, your fields of study, and maybe, and if you're comfortable, how you identify within the disability community. Sure. I think I have a little bit of brain fog, so I think I got all that. I hope I get it all down. <laughs> By all means. <laughs> um, my name is Brooke Abbott. I am a mom. I'm a student. I, I will, more than a mom, I'm a single mom. I am a Student. I'm currently at ELAC and uh, before I was at ELAC to kind of finish up some classes um, in order to transfer, I was over at LAVC. I am born and raised Los Angeles, raised in the San Fernando Valley. And um, I, my pronouns are she, her, um, uh, she, her. She, her, those are my pronouns. <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that. I was looking at my dog kind of lose it for a sec. Um, I am a healthcare advocate when I'm not in school. I actually go to the Hill, uh, Capitol Hill in Washington, DC when there isn't a pandemic. And I fight for um, policies that are related to uh, healthcare disparities and health equity. Um, I am also a patient and a caregiver. Um, I was diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease in 2009, and I had symptoms all through college in the beginning. I was actually a freshman um, in 2001. So I had symptoms and got really, really sick and didn't know what was going on with me. So I dropped out of school. I became a mom. I was diagnosed. And um, along with that initial diagnosis, a bunch of other disabilities and, and chronic conditions came about um, just because that's the way it works sometimes when you're a patient, you have one chronic condition that opens up, you know, a whole Pandora's box. Um, and I've just been navigating this space um, of being a student and a mom and a patient uh, since 2019. So here I am. 
Thank you, Brooke. Uh, hi, Mitzi. Well, I'll have you introduce yourself in just a second. But Ryan, if you kind of want to introduce yourself again and let people know all that good stuff about you. <laughs> um, well, my name is Ryan Estango. Um, so let me see if I got all this right. Just like Brooke, it was a lot. So <laughs> my pronouns are he and, he and him. Um, let me see. So I transferred from East Los Angeles College to UCLA, my dream school. And I majored in English and I minored in Chicano studies. Um, else? So my disability is arthrogryposis, which is a muscular disability. Um, it impacts the muscles and joints throughout the arms and legs. Um, believe it or not, my case is actually very mild in comparison to other folks that identify with arthrogryposis. But just like uh, Brooke said, one disability kind of leads into another. Um, so because of my one disability, it kind of caused me to have severe scoliosis. And because of my scoliosis, my spine is really, really, it kind of looks like a, a candy cane. Um, but um, as I believe it was uh, the very first presenter, um, so, uh, Dr. Sanom, I believe, he mentioned uh, we know our bodies best. So when I was attending East Los Angeles College, I started out actually um, with uh, kinesiology to learn more about my own body and my disability and how the, the human anatomy works. Um, unfortunately, UCLA does not have kinesiology, so that's how I ended up at English. Um, I have two children, um, a 14-year-old and a 12-year-old. So I became a daddy around 21 years old. And so my kids actually went through my entire academic journey with me um, when they were going through uh, preschool and kindergarten, when I was going through uh, ELAC. And so here we are today, ready to talk to all you people. Thank you, Ryan. And Mitzi, it's so good to see you. I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt for just a second. I have had the privilege of working with all of these people. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna date Mitzi here for just a second, but I'm so excited because Mitzi was actually my peer advisor back in the day. Um, so when I was a student coming through CCP and the um, NSTP program, Mitzi was actually my peer advisor. So I'm really stoked to be able to moderate this panel and to share space. So I'm without, for, without, you know, talking, taking up too much space. Um, I was, Mitzi, if you can introduce yourself and um, just kind of share your name with us, um, you know, kind of your academic journey um, and sort of how you identify in the disability community, if you're comfortable sharing that. Uh, awesome. Thank you. And yes, it is dated out. I was on another panel before and I was reflecting on how long ago that was, you know, it's like a decade or, or more. Right. And so definitely I'm excited to be here. I was a transfer student before um, I got involved with CCCP. I went through Santa Monica Community College and then I got linked to CCCP. And that's how my journey to like navigating a community college kind of started. Um, for me, I'm along a different spectrum from disabilities in terms of like health-wise physically, like there's some um, like nerve damage and then there's also some cognitive. So I do have different learning abilities as well. So there is a uh, dyslexia, ADHD, and just other ones that I've throughout my life that I've been diagnosed and been given. And so, and just recently I got diagnosed with tinnitus. So this is like buzzing in my ear that is constant. So that's something now as now a professional right now, I'm no longer a student having to navigate that and asking for like assistance even in my workplace. So it's, it, it's a various things, but definitely I um, took advantage a lot when I was at uh, Santa Monica College when I learned it. I think a lot of you might know of this. I think they still have it, but back in when I was in school, um, there was that counseling one-on-one, like everyone, like once you enroll, you take, or they encourage you to take. And that's when I learned that there was like a students with disabilities program. I'm like, oh, I did that when I was in high school. So let me see what they offer at the community college level. Cause I didn't know as an adult, there's continued support. So I didn't, I, I wasn't told that. So um, when I learned and I heard of all the different supports that they offer, that kind of helped me um, to kind of navigate and kind of figuring out my own learning styles and how to advocate and support for myself. Um, so definitely there. And then after Santa Monica, I transferred to UCLA. Um, I majored in African-American studies with minors in theater and education. 
And then uh, years later, I went to uh, the rival school, USC, for my master's in social work. And I'm currently a, a psychotherapist with Children's Hospital. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for sharing. Um, and we'll just go ahead and get started with our questions for today. And so, you know, one of the questions that we have, I think talking about, talking about disability still remains very taboo. It remains something that, and we've talked about this kind of in different ways um, throughout the day. And so talking about it, so I'm gonna, I feel, I feel empowered to just call a thing a thing and I'm gonna use the word disability, right? In, in, in all of my questions, because um, I think there is some stigma, right? Around saying the word disability and being transparent around how we even talked about this event as we were planning it, we went from talk, we went from saying um, student, you know, student differently abled, right? Um, and we, you know, in conversations with, with ourselves on the planning committee and whatnot, we went, we're like, no, we need to call a thing a thing. And we need to, we need to reframe that narrative around disability being deficit. So we're, we're I'm going to use, I'm going to use disability in everything I say. <laughs> so just prefacing that and giving some background and some context around why, why we, why, why, and why we should, right? Um, so for this first question, um, what has been or what has been or what is what was, um, however you are in that time spectrum, um, been a key moment in sort of your transfer journey as it relates to your dis disability identity? And we can start with whoever wants to start first. I, I can start. If that's sure, cool. go for it, Ryan. Um, so for me, okay, so it's a little funny. Um, I never really realized my disability or never really because I was born disabled right so my family my friends never really treated me disabled or different cool right um it was my my very first time kind of going to uh cccp on one of the field trips that they offered and they ordered the bus um and like I said before I used to live in my dream school so this is going to be my very first time to go see my dream school and um the bus came, but it wasn't wheelchair accessible. Mm. <laughs> and um, anyways, the um, the lady that was responsible at the time, her name was uh, Paulina Palmero. And she was so upset because she specifically ordered a bus with a ramp, but the bus didn't come. They, they sent a non-wheelchair accessible bus. So for me, it was... Um, they everybody like they were like you know you know what we're gonna go and he's gonna go too so what they did they literally put my wheelchair underneath the storage where the bus goes and they carried me like i got like a piggyback ride onto the bus and here we are going to ucla my dream school for the very first time for me that was one another um aspect of it was um during our break or i don't know earlier i mentioned about me joining the kinesiology and so when you think of kinesiology, um, you think of the, the um, you know, physically actively fit person, but the kinesiology club elected me to be the president, and me, that was um, that was an honor because not only my members holding me accountable, but they also let me know like no we are liking you because of your intellectual ability, not because of your, your physicalities. And to me, that was very, very um, rewarding and very, very honor. Um, and then when I to UCLA, a lot of uh, transitioning and a lot of uh, obstacles to learn I mean, But for me, one of the greatest things that I really did experience was how much like CCCP community really did care and um, supported my, not only my, my academic needs, but my emotional needs, my, my physical needs, anything that I really, really needed. Um, it really got that support, you know? Um, so to me, it was just, um, just a blessing. Um, like I said earlier, um, there were obstacles, but for the most part, I was just blessed to, to be able to, to be myself. And um, also one of the, the things that the very first presenter said, I learned to love my disability. I learned to like finally accept it throughout the years and um, love it. Um, it even got into the point where like, you know, uh, one of the counselors a minute ago said we needed a special accommodations where I would literally go into a class and no accommodations were made for whatever reasons. 
I would be that one student that would have to pack, make a bunch of noise, and noise just to rearrange the desk so I could get in. And mm-hmm. just like, I'm there, it was like, okay, cool, I'm here. You know, I learned to to love that. I learned to love that that, that attention that my uh, my disability brought to the environment. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Yeah. Um, Brooke or Mitzi, did you want to add to that question? Yeah, I was um, I was thinking as Ryan was talking, there were kind of like two parts to it. Um, the very first was in the beginning uh, when I decided that I was going to come back to school and I was going to transfer and I decided on the school that I was going to go to. Um, the very first meeting that I had with the counselor when I, and I was very transparent, having been someone who was sick and, you know, was very like silent and I lived in my own silo of what was happening to me um, because I was just afraid of stigma and everything to then becoming this advocate who was, you know, very, very vocal. If you type in my name, it's like disease, disease, disease. So I, you know, I felt very empowered going into this meeting with this counselor and saying like, well, this is what's going on and this is my plan and this is what I want to do. And the first thing out of her mouth was, well, you know, you have a lot going on Mm. with the kids, with your disability, with your illness. Um, what you're looking at doing is very ambitious. Now I'm, I'm only getting the education to continue to work in the space that I'm already working at. And this woman was literally telling me that I had too much going on. Mm -hmm. I know I have a lot going on, but somehow in the last few years, I've, I've found a way to navigate it. And when I walked out of that meeting, my, my child looked up at me, oh gosh, uh, I think, let's see, they're almost 12 now. So they were almost 10 then. And uh, they look up at me and they go, mom, I think that lady was shading you. And I was like, yeah, she was. And you know what? We're going to figure this out. We're going to organize ourselves. We're going to create a schedule and we're going to figure this out. And I I left there like, kind of like, you know what? Maybe I don't need accommodations. Maybe, maybe I should save those accommodations for someone who really needs them? Like, maybe I don't really need them. And that week I was sitting with my cousin, we were having dinner, a family dinner, and they were, you know, everyone was asking about school. And my cousin was like, well, have you gone to the disability center yet? And I was like, well, you know, um, my disease is invisible. So it's already like a thing. People get weirded out about like why I need those accommodations. I was like, and, you know, I should save them for someone who really needs them. And she goes, maybe you should really think about the fact that maybe you really do need them. And it's okay to ask, like, it's okay to be in need of help. But the counselors, her, her statement was in the back of my head. So I was, I was struggling with trying to prove her wrong, but also being like, oh gosh, I really do have a lot going on. And also my disability is invisible. So if someone sees me walking in with the cane one day and then the next day they're like, you're like running around and you're fine, Where, what's going on with you? Um, so what I did was I, I went home and I made a list of what happens to me in a day and then what happens to me in a week and then what happens in a month and then what does a year look like? And I realized, you know, I within a year have been in and out of the hospital a few times. Um, I have brain fog, I have nausea, I uh, sometimes can't walk long distances. There are times when um, I have uh, frequent, um, I have needs to go to the bathroom frequently. Um, There are times when my hands kind of freeze up and I'm not able to utilize them as well as I was the day before. And then there are days when my fatigue is so bad that I literally am falling asleep while I'm talking or while I'm typing. I have, (laughs) I have written an essay and woken up and there's like F, 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 because my hands, you know, have totally like hit the keyboard. So I thought about all the things and I wrote all them all down and I was like, okay, well, let me figure this out. So I went to the center. I gave that counselor my list of you know, issues. I didn't necessarily go in with needs. I went in with issues. And I was like, this is what happens to me. What 
what do you think that I could get? And what do you think that I need? And I took her suggestions and I thought about what I may need and, and we came up with a plan. And um, after that is when I really, really felt like, ooh, I can really do this. Like I'm, I'm not, not only am I going to do this, but I can do this. I'm not, my biggest worry was dropping out again and having to drop out again. And I realized that the, the further along I went, and the more I opened myself up to the possibility that I was really going to do this, the more that doors tended to open and things started falling, falling in my lap that would help me move forward because I was being transparent. I was being honest with myself and I was forgiving myself for a lot of uh, things that people would normally call pitfalls. Uh, they were just things that normally happen and I was just kind of rolling with them. Thank you, Brooke. Mitzi, did you want to add to that? Yeah, definitely. Um, I was, as I'm sitting here, I'm reflecting a lot on just like the word disability. I think I grew up with like a diagnosis is always being told like, you know, you have a limitation and kind of coming to terms and owning it and being comfortable. And still to this day, it's still something that, you know, struggling with, but kind of finding that ownership. And in terms of a, a transfer student, like finding that support and others that are like in similar kind of stage and seeing like, yeah, I can, I can do the things, you know, that I set my, you know, my mind to, or my goals and stuff. Cause before it's like, you have this, you have all these things, like, this is going to be too hard for you. Like, are you sure you want to apply to UCLA? That's a top research institution. Like you, you you're struggling cognitively, like that might be too hard for you. Your disability is going to keep you from that. And kind of just going like, no, I, I can do it. I'm going to try. And everyone else needs to adapt to me and my needs and mm. how I learn. Right. And so getting comfortable with that. And I think like talking to counselors and all these times, like I would get upset, like, no, I'm, I'm able to do this. Yes, my disability this is what I have, but that means everyone else needs to adapt to me, not me adapt to what these systems and how I'm supposed to think and speak and do things. So I think it's just like throughout my journey, just working on figuring out um, and finding that support and finding my voice too to be comfortable with like this is who I am this is what um, this is what I need and everyone else needs to accommodate and do things um, to help me right to kind of move forward so I think a lot about like counselors and stuff we're kind of like are, are you sure you want to do that are you sure you don't want to do this because it's going to be less stressful less strenuous right or even doctors too with um with other things that I go through with muscular and stuff like you sure you want to kind of do that you sure you don't want to take a, a step back and say no I want to try like don't limit me like let me determine how far I want to go right um and so oftentimes I find myself um in that area but as a transfer student and then getting into UCLA I remember getting that letter it's like all right I got in now to do the work and show not just everyone else that said I can't do it show it to myself right to kind of be like yeah I can do this I can write I can do research I can tell my story and I can do all the other things that I um, propose myself to do so definitely in that and in that sense of what I wanted to to share with you all thank you so much for answering those questions and being transparent all three of you appreciate I appreciate that kind of sharing just what the the, the good and the bad, right? And I, I appreciate your transparency in that because I think that's very important in having these conversations, um, disability or not, right? Um, the good and the bad. I think one of the questions that I have, and again, I'll start with you, Ryan, um, is, and because I, and full disclosure, Ryan and I have had these conversations, right, about recommendations and what we need to be doing better and how we can improve. So that's kind of the reason why I'm starting with Ryan. Um, but what recommendations or best practices um, would, you, would you want community college staff and faculty to know to better support um, and enable success for transfer students? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> there's a lot. We can go yeah, through. yeah. We're, we're having, we're having, you know, we're having quote unquote hard conversations in this space. Necessary and hard conversations. For one, like, damn, stop holding our damn hands. Mm. Like, we're, we're, we're able to, to, you know, we're able to do what we got to do, you know, just because we're disabled doesn't mean we need to be treated special, you know what I mean? We're able to, um, if we need special accommodations or or help, we'll ask for that. Well, we can speak up for ourselves, you know what I mean? Um, there's programs out there that are able to help us get what we need. But um, one of the things that I, that really, really just irks me is when 
I'm automatically um, needed that that special attention or special uh, whatever. I'm like, I don't need that. I don't need that. Um, one of the things that I really, really love doing is the fact that I can excel in a class um, in like those those higher academic classes and really show that I'm here because I'm smart enough to be here. I'm not here for whatever reason, like, you know what I mean? Um, another thing too is um, at the same time, do have a little consideration. So for instance, I had a class up in Rolf Hall. Um, unfortunately, the, um, the elevator up in Rolf Hall, my class was in the third floor. I think we spoke about this before. Um, well, the elevator doesn't always work. And there's not a giant ramp going up to the third floor. <laughs> so um, I would miss those days. And there was a moment, um, I think it was my first quarter at UCLA, where the ramp was literally out almost over a month. And I missed all that material. Um, and I was still responsible for learning it. I think one of the things I would um, like to see is um, the universities and different institutions have backup plans for for cases like that have um i'm not necessarily saying things are always going to happen but when they do happen have some sort of uh plan b you know what i mean um top-notch university why why is there a reason that elevators are for three four weeks you know they they got all this money that they put into um let's just let's just be real they got all this money that they put into to things that are non-academic directly related to their students, but they can't uh, to keep their elevators in proper conditions where their disabled students can go and get their education to the fullest. So to me, that, that, that's a big, that's a big work there, you know what I mean? And it wasn't just UCLA, it's, it's happened at ELAC also, so it, it happens to institutions. So I think these sort of um, things need to be there. Another thing is, uh, let's talk about um, certain certain programs, okay? Um, it's, it doesn't even exist no more because I uh, try to utilize a service before when I first um, started with UCLA. Um, it was a service that took students home um, as long as they lived within 30 miles of campus and I lived 27 miles. So what ended up happening was um, when I applied, they told me that the service was not wheelchair accessible and I was really upset because I uh, I commute. I live in the city of Alhambra, so I was commuting. I was taking the the city bus from from campus to the Expo Line, from Expo Line to downtown LA, and then from downtown LA, I was taking the metro bus. Um, anywhere I was um, commuting, going and coming back, anywhere between uh, two to three hours each way. Um, so yeah, I, I could have used that service provided two Bruins, but because it was not wheelchair accessible, um, I initially uh, complained about it, but um, instead of um, the services uh, modifying their, their policies or whatever, they just shut it down. So at that point, there was no more service that took the students home. And that was their way of saying, um, now we're treating everybody equal. So let's just be real. Like these are some of the the, the, the facts that we have to um, uh, the realities of, of the things that we got to deal with. Yeah. Um, navigating through campus was always interesting at first. Um, thankfully, um, I, I believe he's a part of this. Uh, Beto, Beto Moreno. Yeah. If it wasn't for Beto, I would have never learned to go through the business building to go from. Uh, the quad area where Jan Steps is all the way up to North Campus. Um, instead of going all the way around, I, I learned shortcuts. So um, these are the other things, you know, if you're going from one side of campus to other, we just can't go down the steps or um, go through the buildings. We have to literally learn how to navigate the campus our way to the best of our abilities. So one of the things that I recommend anybody that's in a wheelchair is kind of understand that it does take us a little while longer to get from class to class. And we usually have about 10 minutes if we're taking class back to back. We usually have that, that 10 minute span. So we really got to ask ourselves, can we do it? I had a class in a bunch hall. Um, I believe it was on the seventh floor. Oh man, that was crazy getting up in bunch because 
you have like four elevators or six, but for a period of time, only two are working. And people don't don't necessarily think like, hey, I can use the stairs. This individual cannot use the stairs. Maybe we should make space for this person to, to get mm-hmm. in. So you have to have that real on real real talk with your professors like let your professors know like hey if i'm late um excuse me for being late but this is what i have to go through in order to get to class right yeah. also do some of your oh, courses. no after your courses too like if you have to if like i know a lot of times professors just want to talk about those courses just like what do we talk about today it's okay to ask your professor like hey professor you know I have to leave like maybe two, three minutes before class ends just so I could beat the big wave of people. Mm. I'm exiting the building, which I can, you know, then go get to my next class on time. Um, For me, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to open it. I I apologize. I thought you were done. I'm sorry. Zoom is weird that way. But continue. Yeah. And for me, honestly, like I said, my even though there are programs like the DSPS and the CAE and other, uh, the Department of Rehabilitation, these are some of the services that, that we heard about today. But honestly, my biggest support were my other students that were next to me in those courses with me. And like I said, CCCP. So sometimes we just got to figure out what really works best for us. Um, it's not always... I would just say this, everything is not what it always seems like on the surface. So sometimes you just really need to do your own research and figure out what works best for you as an individual and make the most out of it. Because um, at the end of the day, we all deserve to be in these spaces. And I think when we excel in these places, in these spaces, we let the rest of society know like, wow, that's cool. They really do. Um, It's more of a mental thing. And it, it kind of brings a little more awareness for the rest of the disabled community coming up in the future, you know? So it is, um, we are trailblazers. Um, so let's get it. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Um, I would also just ask, I'm gonna go ahead and ask Brooke really quick. Um, what, what again, and Ryan talked about this too, but um, again, what recommendations or advice do you have for students with, with disabilities navigating the transfer process in higher education as someone who is going to be, you know, submitting her applications this fall. So totally, totally putting you on blast and putting you on the spot. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But, but as someone who's who's working through that process right now, um, what recommendations do you have for, for someone who's, who's navigating that experience with disabilities? Well, first get out of your own head. That's the biggest thing. I think that uh, we often decide uh, that we don't need or that someone else needs it more than us or um, that it's not available to us or that uh, it's not for us before we even try. Um, My mom always says, no one can stop you but you. Um, And so the first thing is get out of your own head. And then, you know, take advantage of all of the things that are available to you. Be transparent. I know how hard it is to talk about what's going on in your life, how you're feeling, asking for help. Um, Our society, Americans are raised to not complain. Uh, We stigmatize people who need help. We stigmatize people who... um, are in need of things, uh, we put them in brackets, we put them in, in, in certain areas. Um, but at the basic level, we just need equity, just like we do racially, just like we do gender wise, uh, we need equity. So there are things in place, there are systems in place to be able to help you to have that equity to move forward. You've got, um, you know, actual programs, but then there are also these little small peer-to-peer um, clubs and programs that are on campus. And I absolutely tell, you know, I tell all patients who reach out to me online to take advantage of those, to make sure that you are speaking to your professors and being transparent with them, um, because more often than not, those professors um, will not maybe they won't be necessarily like accommodating outside of their own parameter, their own parameters, but they'll be able to um, 
communicate with you and, and, and be there for you if you need some sort of support or lead you to a specific area that you didn't even know about on campus or, you know, in, within the transfer process that you weren't aware of that can actually help you um, navigate through the system better. Um, also, I really, 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 truly recommend going online onto social media platforms and finding health advocates. There are people um, that specifically their job day to day is to help patients navigate either the hospital system, healthcare coverage, school, um, you know, accommodations in the workplace, things like that. And so if you are dealing with some sort of disability, whether it's visible or invisible, there is someone online that is out there that has resources available that can help you navigate the system. Um, and, you know, also like, you're just know that you're worthy. You're worthy of being in this space. You are definitely dealing with more than what most people are dealing with. And the fact that you are here, the fact that you are in school, the fact that you are getting the grades that you're getting, the fact that you are navigating through all your intersectionalities and making it happen for yourself, you are probably doing more than the average person. Sometimes, honestly, when I'm feeling like the lowest of lows, when, you know, the, the mom guilt is heavy, when the, the friend guilt is heavy, when I'm just like not feeling it and I'm feeling exhausted, I will make a list. I'm a list. I'm, I, I make a lot of the lists. Okay, let's just start there. I'm a list maker. That's what I do. So I make a list of all the things that I have accomplished. Um, when you are suffering from fatigue, you don't even realize how you've navigated that day. You don't even realize how many things that you've accomplished that day. If you take the time to write it down and realize that you have navigated your way through things that maybe most people think are minimal or minute and they're not really necessarily a big deal. When you're dealing with a certain disability, those are huge, huge monuments. Um, I have AS, ankylosing spondylitis. So there are days before I was on a regular treatment schedule when I literally could not get out of bed, but I still found a way to walk my kid to school. That's an accomplishment. When I wrote that down and realized that I had walked my kid to school and then picked him up and then walked back to walked back home, helped with homework. Um, at one point, I was a little league coach. I was coaching. I was standing up. I was doing those things. Those are big deals. And you know what? You're allowed to pat yourself on the back. So take a moment. Definitely, you know, think about self care. Um, I like Jewel said. I'm in the middle of this. You know application situation. I've also got a kid going into middle school. Mm -hmm. That's a whole different thing. Um, and I have, you know, the fall semester coming up. I just finished the summer semester. I have a nonprofit. Um, I am literally doing a lot of things. And when I think about self-care, most people think about like going away or doing these huge elaborate things. No, my self-care is having my kid go walk the dog so that I can have a silent house for 15 to 20 minutes, <laughs> drinking coffee that's actually warm and fresh, not reheated 10 times and having breakfast to myself and being like, Hey, that looks good. Can I touch that? Like, can I have some of that? Like having a quiet moment, that's my self care so that I can kind of organize my thoughts, get myself together and really think about the, the things that I need to do. Um, and if you are, you know, if it's 11 o'clock at night and you realize that you just can't do it anymore and you're, you're studying, go to sleep and get up the next morning and start over again. Um, really focus on what you need and how you need it and know that your individual needs are important and they're, they're made for you and they are justified. Thank you, Brooke. Um, Mitzi, we have time for one more question. I want to be mindful of people's uh, priorities and be respectful of that. And it's, you know, it's been a long day on Zoom. So I want to also be mindful of that. Um, the last question that I have, and Brooke kind of talked about it in her, in her, in her response is how you've taken care of yourself. And I think I'd like everyone to answer that really quickly. Um, but how you've taken care of yourself in, in the last year. So I'll start with you, Mitzi. 
Yeah, so definitely. And and what Brooke was saying, like sometimes with self-care and things like the elaborate thing, obviously if you can, like spas are nice, right? Spas are nice, do it. But even just taking moments to like take a breather, to go outside, to like just have that quietness and and just you time is so important. And that's what I've been doing because I am in a role where I'm a caretaker, not just in my professional life, but in my personal life for a lot of folks. So taking a moment for just me to just stare outside, take in the sun, cuddle my pup, um, those little moments before I start my day is um, something that I try to do on, on the regular. So I definitely do that in self-care and then try to do the other things because they do feel good, some massages and stuff, but definitely that. Thank you. Yeah. And I appreciate you elaborating on, you know, also being someone with, with, with disabilities, but also caring for other people. Cause I think so many times we, we occupy multiple roles and um, intersections. So thank you for sharing. Um, Ryan, did you want to share? about how you've kind of taken care of yourself in the last year? Um, well, I got a snake. <laughs> <laughs> My pandemic pet. So I got into pythons. Um, I started my tutoring business. Um, so I'm tutoring now. Um, I also got another job, um, become the manager of where I'm currently working at. So I just been staying busy. Um, I dabbled with applications to go back to school, but for some reason, just never got around to um, completing them, which I'm not really proud of, but it is what it is. That's real. Um, Thank you for being transparent. Yeah, it is what it is. Um, I don't know. I just been really, um, one of my, my tutoring videos, I posted my videos online, um, got over a million hits. And because of that, I've been tutoring all around the country and even places from other countries. So I think just um, experiencing new life, um, new cultures, new people, even though it's not in person, just getting to know these people is really, really helping me get through what we've been living through the past, what year, almost two years now. Yeah. Um, so that um, knowing that I am, there's good people out there that are still advocating for others is definitely, definitely something that's inspirational to me. Um, the work that CCCP does and seeing that regardless of the pandemic, seeing all the work that you all do is very, very inspiring to me. It, it you know, it, it brings a smile to my face. Um, being a dad, being a dad is definitely crazy right now during these crazy times. Um, to a uh, 12 year old and a 14 year old, definitely not what I expected. Um, you know, kind of expected in football games and baseball games and cheerleading competitions and stuff like that, but nope. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's just, uh, just, just adapting, taking it day by day and just looking forward to tomorrow and trying to just be a better person every day. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate that. And again, appreciate your transparency about not really knowing how you're doing it, but you're doing it. And I think that's kind of what that's kind of the message that's been shared in this space is oftentimes we don't know how we're doing all the things that we're doing, but we're doing it for, for a reason and we're doing it for a purpose. So, yeah, I don't know, Brooke, if you wanted to elaborate on kind of what you're doing. I know you shared a little bit, but if you wanted to add to what you shared. Yeah, um, you know, with just the heaviness of the pandemic, I found that I needed to be a little bit more communicative um, and a little bit more uh, transparent in what I need and, and using the word no. Um, mm -hmm. I've also really relied very heavily on my medical team um, in the sense that I have been very vocal about what my goals are. Um, what I what I want to accomplish as a person. So I need them to be on board with finding and helping me navigate through treatment and uh, through feeling better and also not waiting uh, till the last minute when I'm really, really feeling really, really horrible. Um, mm -hmm. I had a problem with that where I would just, you know, I'd go in and then I'd get a blood test and he's like, that's because you have literally no medication in your system. How long have you been feeling like this? And now that you know the hospitals and the medical buildings are kind of restricted um, to like, I don't really have access as much as I did before. I need to be a little bit more vocal and a little bit more proactive. So I think, I think it's almost made me just really appreciate who I am, where I've come, where I'm going. Um, it's helped me to organize myself 
And it's made me a little bit more communicative with people, the people around me, the people who support me um, outside of my family and my friends, like, you know, the, the, the patients that I work with online, the, you know, colleagues that I have in Congress, the people that, you know, help me with my diseases. Those are just, those are the people that I've really reached out on, reached out to, and I've relied on them. Um, and I think that I've also made it very clear that they can rely on me too. And I've stopped really feeling guilty for having to say no. So it's kind of like a, a hosh posh of like becoming like a, um, a more well-rounded person, even though I thought I was a well-rounded person. I think that this has just made me sit with myself a little bit more and, and made me realize that I need to be more of a, a person's person and a more of a me person, if that makes any sense. I think it does. I think it does. And everything that you've spoken to in terms of, because we have this idea around self-care be again, to the points that you've all have made around self-care being, you know, bath bombs and, and massages. And that's part of it. Right. But I think also the point around it being like self-care is so individual and caring for yourself. Right. I'm not even going to call it self-care because I think that's been tokenized and co-opted and capitalized on, but I think caring for yourself, right. Um, has, has, is, is different for everyone and it looks different for everyone. And I, you know, I always say like, people are like, what's your self-care doing? And I'm like turning off my phone, you know, <laughs> cause I'm like, I'm done. Like I've reached my, with, I've reached a point where I can't, where I can't do anything for anyone else right now. Um, so, so yeah, I appreciate all of what you all have shared and just for your time and your energy and your commitment to this work and, you know, creating space for other students and students like yourselves and, and you know, people, right? Um, people who come from similar and intersectional identities. So I appreciate your time, each and every one of you for being here and for creating community with us in space. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, you all will give a round of applause, use your emojis, use your, you know, use your chat for, to give, to give our panelists some love um, and some thank yous. Uh, we'd appreciate it. So thank you all for being here with us. Um, at this point, I think we're going to move into our wrap up for the day. Um, and I know Ariel has some, some more goodies that we're trying to give away. Um, so, and I promise we won't forget anyone this time. <laughs> So um, I will turn it over to, to Arielle. Thank you, Joel. Um, and again, thank you, all of you. Um, Ryan, Brooke, Mitzi, that was amazing. <laughs> I'm just like, once again, glued to my screen. So um, thank you so much for sharing all of your personal narratives, your journeys and your experiences and everything. Um, I will get into the... Um, raffle right now so let me just share my screen again and all right I made sure to include everybody I hope I didn't miss anyone but let's see who's gonna go. okay so Chris H has won our second raffle. Um, so Euridia will be DMing you some details and request some information so that we can get connected with you. Um, and I think after that, yes. We were doing two. Oh, sorry, my apologies. <laughs> My bad, y'all. Okay. <laughs> um, and let me do raffle round two. All right. And our second winner is Karina A. So we will also be messaging Karina A. Um, so thank you. I'm going to stop my share. And I think we'll just, we're going to get into some um, announcements and our final wrap up. We do understand um, we're a little bit over. Um, so if you do have to go, we understand. But again, we're just going to um, talk about some upcoming stuff that we have, upcoming webinars, and close it out. I can share my screen with this. Oh, okay. I forgot for a second that I had <laughs> responsibilities, y'all. That's what happened. 
<laughs> so just a couple of announcements to wrap us up for the day. Uh, tomorrow, um, we are having our African-American Black webinar. So we're really excited about that. Um, the, an opportunity to engage with folks from, you know, who identify as Black, Black, former Black transfer students, current Black transfer students, um, UCLA alum, um, other institution alum. So we're really excited for that tomorrow. So that's happening tomorrow. Um, busy week at CCP this week. Um, next, and then the day after, we have our Native Pacific Islander webinar. So if you are, if you or someone you know or someone you love, um, it's just based with a community with um, identifies as Native, a Native American or Pacific Islander or Indigenous in any way, um, we would love to have them come through for that event. And then lastly for this week, um, but again, we have a number of webinars happening next week too. But lastly for this week on Friday, we have our first Gen webinar. Um, so keep, if you're interested in attending that, continue to follow us on social media, all the posts are up there. Um, and also you will be receiving emails um, on the, to get the link and whatnot for those. So again, busy week at CCP. Next week we have our Southeast Asian, our non-trad and our undocumented and our chicken X that next. So busy week at CCP. Um, just also another announcement really quick. If you haven't already had an opportunity to um, complete the CCP scholars application and you are continuing at a community college or enrolling at a community college, or again, know someone who is, we would love to have them be a part of our scholars program for the academic year. Um, so we can drop that link in the chat as well. If you haven't already had a chance to do that, you have until the 23rd of August to do that. So next week. Um, and oh, then, oh, also, sorry. And if you did apply, make sure you're checking your emails so that you can confirm <laughs> your participation in the program. Yes. That's just my only tip. <laughs> Um, that is a very good point. I forget about that myself. So thank you for <laughs> saying that, Ariel. Um, lastly, um, we have our group me. So if you would like to continue to create community with folks, please join the group me. Um, it, it'll be an opportunity to kind of engage with folks and connect with folks. And we'll be dropping links and whatnot in that periodically. So just a way to engage. Um, and then we already had our raffle time. So <laughs> um, and then lastly, just our kind of just our contact information, our handles, um, our phone numbers, our emails. So just so you all have that. Um, and I think that's it. I think I'm done. I think that's all I got. <laughs> I don't know if anybody on our committee wants to say any parting words um, to, to, yeah. Could I say something? Of course, Ryan. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody that was a part of this. This is very uh, special to me and for everybody that participated or just, you know, was here to listen. Um, it was very, very um, honored to be here. So thank you all. On that, I got to go. So everyone have a great day. <laughs> thank you, Ryan. We appreciate you always coming through. Peace out. Um, I don't know if anyone else from our committee wants to say anything or... You know. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. Um, thank you to Jewel and Ariel. It was so much fun um, just being planning with them. And also I got to meet Ryan, which was really cool. He's so he's just really amazing. I'm really, really happy I got to meet him. And thank you to everyone who was here and also to the other PAs. You guys were so awesome, like putting in the questions in the chat and like, yeah, everyone was so wonderful. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, I want to say we did it. <laughs> we were so nervous putting this together, but we are so happy that it actually came to life. Um, and every single one of you helped us to bring it to life. All of our panelists, speakers, presenters, all of you who are students, scholars, thank you so much for being here with us, our peer advisors. Um, and thank you for joining. Thank you for being part of the inaugural cohort. It's just what? <laughs> literally our hearts are so full so um just really really want to thank you um so much and we couldn't have done this without you all and I think that the energy the vibrancy the empowerment everything was really just because every single one of you so I just want to say thank you I hope you have a wonderful wonderful beautiful day I hope you learned a lot um if you hadn't learned some things I hope that you got a lot of resources I hope you feel empowered and inspired and again thank you so much Ditto to what Ariel said. Um, I couldn't have said it better. So thank you all for sharing space and community with us. And we're looking forward to this being 
there being more of these spaces um, and, and building and, and growing together and building community um, and, you know, bringing, bringing our people along with us. Um, so the, the next time we have this, the space will be even larger. Um, so thank you all. Have a great day. Appreciate you all being here. Um, and I hope, I hope, I hope you all are well and stay well and take care, take care of yourselves and take care of one another. Hi, y'all.